I, I literally think right now is the most compelling, even value-oriented time I've seen in 10 years of doing this, right? Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Dan Moorhead. Dan Moorhead, as president of Pantera, Jasper drives and oversees the strategic vision, direction, and operational management of the firm. He brings over 20 years of leadership experience across global investment management firms. In this video, Dan Moorhead talks about the Feds, stocks, and crypto market. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Bitcoin was up 3.3% Thursday at around $19,100, roughly back to where it was early Wednesday before a wild 24 hours of price swings that spanned the Federal Reserve's latest announcement that it will continue its campaign of aggressive interest rate hikes. The Fed's rate moves have been pushing up the dollar's value in foreign exchange markets, and now cracks are starting to appear. Japan announced its first currency intervention in more than two decades to shore up the yen. Meanwhile, Switzerland, Norway, and the UK all raised borrowing costs in the wake of the Fed's decision. For 42 years, the Fed's just kind of bailed everything out, right? Like, no matter what problem we had on Earth, they just cut rates, or then they buy bonds, or then they buy $9 trillion of bonds. And it just kind of bailed everything out. We were in a 42-year you know, rally in bonds. Rates coming down gave us a long rally in equities, a long rally in real estate, all that stuff. And I think the Fed's really overcooked it here. You know, they really overdid it. Rates way too low on the short end. And a lot of people are starting to get their head around that one. The thing no one's really talking about is their purchase of $9 trillion of mortgages has totally messed everything up. And I just, unfortunately, I don't see us unwinding this thing without housing going down and without the Fed unwinding some of that $9 trillion. So there's just a lot going on. And in 35 years of doing this, this is the most extreme, in my opinion, policy error I've ever seen. And so the pendulum swung way one direction. And unfortunately, it's probably gonna swing way back. That's the macro view. Obviously, hopefully crypto could be isolated from that. But on the macro side, you know, I think we're gonna have rates go way higher, way longer than anyone else is really talking about that the Fed raising 150 basis points sounds super edgy. It's nothing, right? Uh, real inflation's double digits. Um, we've never had Fed funds so far below inflation in the history of our country. Um, so, you know, whatever tightening's already happened, it's a very small amount. And, the, you know, the, the sad truth is inflation's risen as fast as the Fed's tightened. So we really haven't uh, tightened uh, real rates at all. And um, even the Fed's own model, if, if, if one of your readers wants to look at the FOMC statement that just came out at the latest meeting, has they have five or six different uh, models for where rates should be. You know, the Taylor rule and amended Taylor rule and a bunch of other ones. They're all like six or seven percent. And everyone's like, oh, well, cool, we're at 150 or whatever. So we're just so far from where we would need to be to stop inflation that you know, I really think people are, are just kind of struggling to get their head around. In December, we forecast Fed funds going to 5% and times seem super crazy. And now they have cuts already priced into next year, you know, which I, I mean, I wish it were true. I, I wish that would happen, but I just, you know, deep down, I don't think it's true. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I think we probably will break a lot of things, or at least the Fed is gonna break a lot of things. I don't, I don't hold you or me responsible for it. But uh, so your trend would be great if you were looking at a graph of free market actors, you're not. The Fed has been manipulating the bond market, unfortunately now twice big time. So for the first 95 years of the Fed's history, they only did the overnight rate. They never manipulated the capital allocation of our economy. In 2008, they decided, oh, you know, we're really not doing enough with our forward guidance, which is a whole nother topic. So instead of just saying we're gonna keep rates low for a long time, let's just ram 10 year rates much lower. Not sure if that worked very well, but they did it 10 times bigger in this last um, recession. And they ended up buying 9 trillion of bonds. And to, and to put that in perspective, 
the entire record mortgage issuance in the United States is only 1.6 trillion, right? They did four times the entire mortgage origination of the entire United States in bond purchases. So your graph is kind of like old fashioned econ 101. We're like, oh, we're all economically rational, independent actors. We're not. There's an actor that is massive, that is, uh, you know, got different incentive functions. So, you know, you can all, you know, the U.S. has gotten incredible uh, benefits out of being the world's reserve currency. I would imagine that we have seen a peak in the reserve status of the U.S. dollar for a lot of different reasons. The most obvious of which is after the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, government saw that, wow, hmm, you know, people can cancel reserves if they want to. And so, you know, that was like, think, Cy that was like the Cyprus situation at sovereign level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and um, you know, I think it's going to take three or four years, but that will filter into uh, the blockchain industry. And there's going to be governments that say, hey, you know, I'd rather have some of our reserves. I'm not going to say 100 percent, but, you know, like five percent or whatever in Bitcoin. Right. And it hasn't happened yet, but I think it is going to happen. And going back to the, like, why isn't this the JGB trade? Is if you short 10 JGBs at 2% yield and they keep over our rates at zero for 10 years, you will lose 200 basis points. That's the way bond math works, right? And that's why I like being a bond trader back in the day, because if you're right on the path of rates, you win. It is just math. So uh, my thought here is if you're shorting, you know, 10 year notes at two and three quarters, or whatever, and Fed funds have to go to five or six and they stay there for 10 years, you win, right? You have to make money. And, which is very different than currencies that you and I have done, traded over all these years. You can kind of be right in your theory forever and not make money, you know, like <laughs> rate FX doesn't have to go where you and I think it should go. But if you short a bond at two and three quarters and you uh, get paid 5% for the next 10 years, you get to keep the difference. It's just that uh, mathematical. So I do think shorting bonds here is a great trade because the downside is pretty limited. That crypto has gone through these wild cycles, as you know, and sometimes it is kind of bubbly and overbought and sometimes it's really inexpensive. And I, I, I literally think right now is the most compelling, even value oriented time I've seen in 10 years of doing this, right? There were some times it was the same price as it is today, but we were four or five years back in history with, you know, hundreds of millions less using it and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so I think given that we've had a 75% fall in Bitcoin, you know, 80, 90, and some of the other things, we're really at incredibly cheap levels. And, and a couple of metrics on that, um, we've never had a period that Bitcoin's at the same price it was four and a half years ago before. It is. So it's right where it was in 2017. And I got to tell you, like, nothing was is built out in 2017 as it is today, right? We have so much more stuff happening, so many more people using it, all that. So uh, just on a fundamental basis, you know, it, it's better than it used to be, uh, you know, back in that era. And uh, just a great metric for how cheap things have become. All of DeFi, $8 billion. That's crazy, right? We can complain about all of this, about DeFi is only people speculating. Whatever. To be only $8 billion when the financial, the legacy financial uh, industry is $2 trillion, is just cheap. And like you said, it's very asymmetric, right? Say you buy all of DeFi and you pay $8 billion, right? You can only be down $8 billion. You might be up, you know, uh, 10, 20x on that. Uh, and I really do think we're at that level. We're so inexpensive on most tokens that the risk reward is fantastic. And this actually is a great time because they've spent four or five years working through all their issues, all their diligence, all their investment committee, educating their trustees, whatever it is. And they finally got a yes. And now everything's pulled back and is actually a lot cheaper. And so um, we haven't seen enough people pull that trigger yet because I think most investors are really kind of triaging their portfolio, right? This has been a once in a generation shock on the macro markets and blockchain. So everyone's kind of pulling back, trying to make sure they understand, you know, their liquidity positions and all those things. But I do think uh, we're in a pretty good spot where a lot of institutions did just recently get an approval. And in you know, many cases, you know, they allocated like 10 basis points to blockchain, you know, they're hundred billion or hundreds of billions, you know, under management, they, you know, hundred million or whatever in the blockchain. And so, uh, 
you know, you and I have seen commodities become an asset class over the years, emerging markets, all those things. I, I easily can see blockchain being an asset class five years from now. 10 basis points isn't the answer, right? Like it's going to be 500 basis points or 800 basis points. It'd be some much bigger number. So that's another reason I'm really bullish on this space. I've seen a lot of massive entities go through the really hard thing of going from zero to one in terms of being on now. And now that they're on and they have 10 basis points, they could easily go to 20 basis points or 50 or 100 or 500, right? And so I think that's the story for the next 10 years is all these entities that have spent you know, many years getting to the point of saying yes to blockchain, ramping up to whatever a market neutral position will be 10 years from now. But it's, you know, it's a lot higher than it is today. Even if central banks tighten monetary policy further, the situation will not worsen more, for the current performance of crypto assets is terrible enough. Griffin Ardern, volatility trader from crypto asset management firm Blofin, told Coindesk's Amkar Godbol. Ether, the second largest cryptocurrency, was gaining along with Bitcoin, up 4.5% on the day to about $1,300. The broad Coindesk market index was higher, led by Algorand's ALGO with a 12% gain over the past 24 hours. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.